All right, so today in class we talked a little bit about what Newton did. Last night's video we talked a lot about what Newton did. Um, today we're going to talk about actually using Newton's law of universal gravitation. And what that really involves is finding uh, the gravitational constant G. So the person that did this was Henry Cavendish. He was an Englishman. Um, and the experiment he did was called weighing the Earth. Now, he didn't actually weigh the Earth. He just found the gravitational constant G. It turns out you cannot just put the Earth on a scale and, and figure out how much it weighs. You have to do something else. So the name of his, his experiment was weighing the Earth, but what he was doing was finding the gravitational constant. Uh, and we'll look at how that could actually help us find the mass of the Earth. So it has a somewhat misleading name. So if we look at this, um, this is Newton's universal gravitation. The force of gravity is weight. All right, and so we know what the weight of most objects is. That's something that we can calculate way before this ever happened. M would be the mass of the object that we're talking about. And what we need to know is how far away this object is from the center of the Earth. That's what this is measuring, centers of, centers of the Earth. That's what R is. So what we really need is Earth's diameter. Earth's radius, Earth's diameter. And it turns out we've known this for an awfully long time. Um, it was calculated around B.C. 200 uh, by a guy whose name I cannot really pronounce some Greek guy, Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes. He's the guy that calculated the Earth's radius to a high degree of accuracy um, almost 2,200 years ago. So by the time we got to Henry Cavendish, we knew the Earth was round and we knew how round it was. So if I want to find out the mass of the... If I want to, if I want to find out the mass of the Earth... Oh, sorry. This is the radius. 6.37 times 10 to the 6th meters. If I want to find out the mass of the Earth, then I need to find G, because the only thing I won't know in that equation would be the mass of the Earth. So once I find G, anyone, anywhere, as long as they know the Earth's radius, can calculate Earth's mass. That's why they called Henry Cavendish's experiment to find G weighing the Earth. The first thing that he did after that was find the mass of the Earth. So, what did Cavendish do? He used this thing called a torsion balance. This is a very sensitive piece of instrumentation. So, so what he did was take a wire, and he balanced at the end of the wire, um, he balanced these two red spheres, okay? And he let them hang from the wire. Now, something hanging from a wire, it doesn't require very much force to twist it. It's just hanging from a wire. So, uh, if you measure the angle that the thing moves... If you calibrate this thing just right, you can figure out how much force it takes to twist that wire. So what this allowed him to do was to measure a very tiny force to a very high degree of accuracy. So he takes these two masses, balances them from the wire, and then he brings another two masses close to it. And the gravitational attraction between these masses causes them to, to twist that wire a little bit. And so Cavendish measures how much twist there is there, and he knows how much force that corresponds to, and he knows how far apart these things are. So he has all of his little pieces. He knows the force. He knows the masses. He knows how far apart they are. So he can find G. And when he does his little, th his little experiment, G comes out to a very tiny 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meters squared per, and I wrote that down wrong, sorry, 
Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Um, that's the tiny number that he needed to be able to calculate the mass of the Earth and actually use Newton's universal gravitation. So it's important that you know who Henry Cavendish is, and it's important that you know what the torsion balance was and a little bit of how it worked. Now, because we have this number g, we can use this equation now. And just like Cavendish, the first thing that we're going to do is find the mass of the Earth. Once we have that, we can calculate some fun things. So, once we have Earth's... Let's find Earth's mass. So, imagine we have a one-kilogram object. The weight of a one-kilogram object... on the Earth is 9.8 newtons. Weight is just mass times the acceleration due to gravity. We knew these numbers since a little bit before Galileo. So, one kilogram object has a weight of 9.8 newtons. So we take our little gravitational formula, F equals GMM over R squared. We're going to plug in the things that we know. Well, let's rearrange it first. Sorry. So we'll multiply by the radius of the Earth squared on both sides. That goes away. We'll divide by the mass of the object. And we'll divide by g. When we do that, everything on the right side crosses out. And our expression says the mass of the Earth is equal to all that. The radius of the Earth squared times the force of gravity divided by m divided by big G. And so what you need to do is substitute all of the numbers that we have. We know that the radius of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the 6th meters. So we'll plug that in for the radius of the Earth. We'll square it. We know that the weight is 9.8 newtons. We know that the mass of the object is 1 kilogram. And we know that G is 6.67 times 10 to the 11th newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Now, when you put these things into your calculator, instead of doing the times 10 part, remember that you're going to do the second comma thing and use the little E button to do that, or EE, -E, depending on what your calculator says. Be careful with your parentheses. Now, as you do this, some things cross out. Some of those units go away, and we're left with, on the bottom, kilograms. So, it goes to the top, and our units are correct in kilograms. Once we plug everything in, we find the mass of the Earth to be 5.96 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Uh, and what we're going to do is just simplify that a little bit and say that the mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. But this is how we would use uh, Newton's second law, sorry, Newton's universal gravitation to find that. The second thing that we may do with this is just finding the force of gravity between any two objects given their separation. And we'll play around with that a little bit in class. It's a matter of plugging something into the equation. I also might give you more information and just have you find another piece, like what we just did with the Earth. It's basically just using that equation. Um, and then the third thing that we will do in this class is find orbital velocity or orbital speed with Newton's universal gravitation. So, imagine we have the Earth and the Moon. The Earth's in the center, the Moon is going around it. We're going to use some information that we know to find the orbital speed of the moon. Now, looking at it, the force acting on the moon, the only force acting on it, is the force of gravity. So we can use Newton's second law, sum of my forces equals mass times acceleration. And my net force here is just the force of gravity. Um, and since we're going in a circle, we have centripetal acceleration. So we know a formula for the force of gravity. It's gmm over r squared. 
And we'll set that equal to mass times velocity squared over r, because we're going in a circle and we have centripetal acceleration. Now at this point, I know some of you may be saying, doesn't it go in an ellipse? And you're right, it does. But for the purposes of this calculation, to get average orbital speed, it makes it possible if we assume that it's going in a circle and the Earth's at the center of that circle. Even though we know that it follows an elliptical pattern, this allows us to think about the average speed, not the speed at one end or the other. And if you have questions and want to talk about that in class tomorrow, we can. So, some things cross out. One of the radiuses crosses out on both sides, and the mass of the moon crosses out on both sides. So it turns out we don't need the mass of the moon. That's not important to its orbital speed. What is important as we look at this to the orbital speed is the mass of the Earth and how far away the moon is from the Earth. So, if you are at the moon's location, you need to be moving this fast to be in the moon's orbit. This is the kind of thing that a NASA engineer would need to know as they're sending up an astronaut into space. So, we plug in the things that we know. We have 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th for big G. We have the mass of the Earth, which we just found to be 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And we might have to look up how far away the moon is. 3.84 times 10 to the 8th meters. That's going to be equal to our velocity. All we have to do is plug in these known things. We could look them up if we had to, to find that velocity. Plugging them into your calculator, you get the speed of the moon to be 1,021 meters per second, on average, as it goes around the Earth. Tomorrow in class, we will play with these calculations a little bit, and then we will be done talking about gravity for this unit.